Welcome back. We're discussing the role of the International Criminal Court when it comes to holding leading world figures accountable, particularly the situation uh, regarding Darfur in Sudan and Israel's military uh, campaign against Gaza 13 months ago. The court's chief prosecutor, Luis Moreno Ocampo, is with me taking your questions and mine. And Sophia in the UK just before was asking, she made a comparison between the camps in Sudan and, and Gaza as a sort of enclosed area as well. Is there any, I mean, legally, is there any kind of comparison? My, 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 third, pro my third problem is, in Darfur, I had jurisdiction because the Security Council mm -hmm. requests my intervention. Security Council can do it because he's, he's the leader of the UN system. Mm -hmm. In Gaza, the request is coming from Palestine Authority, and it's, it's more complicated to see if they have or no legal authorization. That, that's the, my real discussion now. I cannot yet discuss the alleged allegations of crimes. Right. What about um, Israel's position on this and, and this pressure of, after the Goldstone report for independent investigation in Israel as well? Yeah, that, that's interesting because Israel sent to me a letter saying, we appreciate your effort, but uh, we believe you have to dismiss the case immediately because Palestine is not a state. So stop. That is their position. However, pal uh, they are interestingly, in both sides, now there are people trying to do national investigation, and that's very important. And in fact, the Arab League is playing a key role, support the Palestinian Authority to investigate the crimes. And that's, I think, is, is, the, is the best way to do it. If the national authorities can conduct investigation, they are the best equipped to do it. So we'll see how far they go. In the meantime, I am analyzing this jurisdictional problem, but they can go now, mm -hmm. and Arab League is, is supporting them. Now, of course, you need, uh, in gathering evidence, you need cooperation. Uh, in this case, you'll need the cooperation of Hamas. What have been the, uh, what's the general but feeling that, there? That Arab League is doing. Arab League is discussing with Hamas uh, if they can accept to be investigated, because they can understand, they feel, no, they feel they commit nothing, no crime. Okay, go, accept to be investigated. So, in this sense, Arab League is playing a critical role. That's why I see, in this situation, the regional organization like Arab League could, could be a difference. Mm -hmm. what, what kind of punishment can the ICC impose, assuming everything goes to completion, a court, uh, you know, court... Life sentence. Life, life sentence, sentence, basically. Yeah. So, in theory, it can go as far as that. Yeah. Now, what, what about uh, situations where, I mean, you have, you're, you're looking into Kenya as well, for example. Now yes, Kenya is, is, I request a authorization to the judges to start a new investigation in Kenya in the in the violence during the post-election time. But the thing is that a lot of people fear that, uh, that there may be repercussions if they submit any evidence. There's, there's the fear that whistleblowers have. How do you cope with that? How do you make sure that the ICC can uh, ac accumulate the kind of evidence, gather the kind of evidence it needs when you have the, the situation on the ground where just getting people to come forward might be hard? That's similar to like Darfur. We never went to Darfur. We collect witnesses around the world. So we can collect witnesses who are not exposed. So we're, that's our expertise. We managed to collect evidence without exposing the witness. That's key. We've got Tariq on the line from Washington, D.C. Tariq, what would you like to add? Hi. Um, I wanted to ask a question to Mr. Ocampo about uh, uh, jurisdiction. This is in relation to the Israel-Palestine question that came up earlier. Uh, I, was, I was curious, under the Uniting for Peace procedure in the U.N., uh, I, I know that the UN member states can take action without approval of the Security Council. Can the same procedure be used to give you jurisdiction to prosecute uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, etc.? To, to my intervention required to follow the Rome Statute, who is a law approved with a treaty approved by 110 states today. So it's a system how they join the Rome Statute. Today, 30 countries for Africa, all Europe, all South America, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Mexico are members, Jordan, uh, Afghanistan, all of them are members of the treaty. So that's the way to give me jurisdiction. Of course, it, makes a, it creates a huge problem when you have a country like the United States having managed to find a way out of it and protect itself. But let me ask you, do you I see don't think I don't think so. No? No, because I think this is an idea of countries who have no big armies and they use the law to protect themselves. So. It's normal, the big countries are not inside. The small countries are inside. You know what Costa Rica say? It was a meeting debating why Costa Rica was so vocal on Darfur in the Security Council. And what Costa Rica say? We believe in the law to protect ourselves, so we push for the law. And why? Because Costa Rica, there are 26 countries in the world with no army. Mm -hmm. Costa Rica is the biggest. So Costa Rica had to lead the country who are using the law to protect themselves. And that is a different logic. In a country like U.S., you would not think they are using the law to protect themselves. They, they have armies. Costa Rica has no army. They use the law. And that's why I like this idea. 
It sends a message out, though, when, when you have uh, the world's remaining superpower, as it sees, as often seen, uh, trying to find ways to prevent itself being held accountable, which is how a lot of people see it. How do you think, under the Obama administration, which has always put itself as much more inclusive on the world stage, how do you see things changing in the way it regards the ICC? No, I don't know. I, this is the American discussion. I am glad that the, in, in Darfur, in Palestine, the regional countries are committed. Arab League is building village in Darfur. In Kenya, African Union with Kofi Annan is providing solutions. So that's the point. We are developing a system based on Kenya, on Tanzania, on Costa Rica, on Jordania. These are the countries who are leading. We have, uh, you, of course, the African Union members held their summit in Ethiopia, uh, and it was said that they should improve their strategies for civilian protection and uh, accountability in, in their efforts to end the ongoing crises in, in the continent. How does Zimbabwe differ uh, from countries like Sudan and Democratic Republic of Congo, where people are being held accountable for their human rights violations? Zimbabwe is not a state party of the wrong title, so I, I can say nothing on Zimbabwe. So Congo is a state party, Sudan and Zimbabwe not. Now, at the moment, the ICC has, uh, has uh, jurisdiction over acts of genocide, war crimes, human rights violations, and it's, I, I gather it's currently trying to find ways to uh, process a, a definition for acts of aggression. Um, so, as far as the basic definition so far, which other states do you think might come under that new jurisdiction? If oh, you will? That's, that could be a discussion in Kampala in June this year, but this is a discussion between states. They will define the law. I'm the prosecutor. I apply the law. They will discuss the law. Now your uh, your uh, mandate was scheduled to end in 2012. Yes. Um, and it's been hinted that a reform that would allow the mandate, uh, ma a man reform might allow that mandate to be expanded. Uh, what developments do you have on that? No, no, I don't think. I think my mandate uh, end of June 16, 2012. That's, that's enough. Nine years. I, I'm very glad. <laughs> well, but you've been a very much a leading figure in this. Um, you've been very much the, the driver of the ICC. Um, so presumably there's got to be some sort of succession that would continue that kind of effort. I think we're building an institution for the world and for the next century. So I'm very glad that I was the first. I had nine years, and now someone would replace me, improve, and then we can keep working. But I think it's a collective effort, and that's why I think uh, we are building something new in this, needed for the world, by the total world, for the world, yes. Well, South Africa's on the line. Mohammed, what would you like to ask? Uh, hi, Liz. Um, hi. You know, um, a group of uh, people in South Africa called the Palestinian Solidarity Alliance launched an action uh, against uh, war criminals from uh, that, that were involved in Gaza. Yeah. And in fact, this, this matter, uh, Mr. Campo is familiar with because our Professor John Dugard and his attorneys met with him in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. and, and we were informed at the time that Mr. Campo will in fact be taking this matter up. And we'd like to know very much how far this is because I'm afraid that the sentiment that it seems that only uh, African leaders are prosecuted <laughs> seems to resonate quite well because uh, we haven't heard anything further on this matter. Okay. I'd like some clarification on that. I'll yes. Thank you, Mohammed. No, that, that's very interesting. It's a group of, um, from South Africa, a Muslim group from South Africa, who present a case about a legal advisor of the Israeli armed forces. The peculiarity is this person is South African nationality. And that could provide to me jurisdiction because I can prosecute cases in the territory or by national of the parties. So we are starting, trying to get information about what this man did. So we are proceeding on that. What else is on your radar right now? I know Afghanistan has also started to, to come up a little bit. What state parties where our conflicts are Afghanistan, Georgia, Colombia. So we are, uh, we are trying to monitor what happened there. But the concept of the core is the national state has to do the work. Mm -hmm. So in Colombia, for instance, we are following what they are doing, but they are prosecuting hundreds of people. So we are trying to ensure that, and we're trying to get information of Afghanistan, what happened there. So we are following what happened in, in, in the state party who had crimes, trying to define if we should or not open an investigation. With so many, with so many uh, uh, fronts opening up there, do you have the resources you need? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we are enough. We have uh, 300 people working at my office, high quality, so we're okay. Quick thought, which is a few seconds to go, but uh, if you're going to reach the end of your term and you're happy to end it, what would you like to have achieved by then? No, I'm very proud that I was the prosecutor of this court. This is a long process. Many people were contributing to this idea. I'm very happy that I was w another one helping to move this global justice idea ahead. Luis Moreno Campo, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being with us too. Now remember, you can follow our program on Twitter. We'll keep you notified of upcoming shows, and you can send questions and comments to post to our guests. 
On the next show, talking to the Taliban. As the United States looks to change its strategy in Afghanistan, could its approach to the Taliban also take a new and controversial direction? Be sure to tune in for that. From me and the team, we'll see you next time.